Good morning. Who's joining us? Carolyn Jones. Good morning, Carolyn. This is Nancy. You probably don't recognize my voice because I left it somewhere. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, this morning we've got uh, Mia Leathers. Mia or Maya? I always, Maya. I always do that. Maya Leathers is going to join us, and she's going to talk to us about uh, the kids that are in foster care who have been witnesses to domestic violence and kind of some background on domestic violence. And I am going to go ahead and turn it over to her before I lose my voice completely. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So Megan we'll Roberts, Latinus Behavior Wellness Center. Welcome. Well, I was, I'm sorry, I was this signing is, a paper whenever I said that. No, you're good. Um, this is Maya Lettuce. I'm the mental health consultant for Region 4. So if you've heard, hopefully you have. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, domestic violence and particularly um, batterers. So I have a lofty experience working with batterers in the VIP program here at Oklahoma City. So a lot of my information comes from that. So before we get started, I, let's see. Um, Go next. Okay, there we go. So what is domestic violence? The thing to note when you're working with families that have been victims or kiddos that have been victims to domestic violence is the definition that DHS works with and the definition that the law works with are, are different. And so the law states here in Oklahoma that they just have to be threatened with physical harm. So if the woman is fearful that she's going to be hurt, that could kind of qualify, and it could be 13 years of age or older. So we could have a young um, child or a young um, girl kind of maybe beating up on a grandma or something along those lines that still qualifies as domestic violence. But what we're looking for in this situation is power and control. Um, I will say when you work with DHS, when they substantiate on domestic violence, sometimes it's a, an assault. Uh, that happens between parents, not necessarily domestic violence. It's a domestic violence assault, I will say that. But what we're looking for to substantiate how the family is functioning is if, if there's power and control. So typically in our families, that's going to be the male perpetrating on the female, not always, but I will say like 85% of the time, that's what you can expect. We're going to talk about some ways to know if domestic violence is going on we're going to talk in particular about um, batters because that's where I know, like, the bulk of all my goodies come from. I will say I was sitting in an FTM not too long ago in uh, Region 4, and we had a doctorate-level clinician there. She was working with the victim who does not feel like she is a victim, and she's decided to stay with her, her perpetrator, which is her choice. Uh, and after it, we went to go talk to the doctorate level clinician that is working with the client, and she had no idea based on what the victim was telling her in session and by the appearance of the man in the FTM that there was any domestic violence going on. After the session, she was saying things like, well, I thought he was just, um, he was very scared and he was very nervous, and in reality, he was, he was manipulating the situation. And so it's very easy when you're working with these families to be manipulated. As much as we try to be on our toes, they, they know the system, especially if they've been involved in other states or things like that. So knowing kind of what to look for and how to interact with the family, I hope is going to be beneficial as we move forward. So looking at the stats, uh, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner. In the DV world, we call it intimate partner to include our LGBT population. On an average, there are 20,000 phone calls placed to DV hotlines a day. And women between the ages of 18 and 24 are the most commonly abused by an intimate partner. So if you are working with a family that, you know, the woman is around that age, this is something to kind of keep in mind, especially in rural Oklahoma, we have huge problems with domestic violence. I would say probably the majority of the cases that come across your desk are substance abuse related or domestic violence related. We have a lot of problems here. Only 34% of people who are injured by an intimate partner receive medical care. So sometimes when you enter the home, 
especially as an embedded worker, you're like the first boots on the ground kind of thing. You may even be in the home the day that you get a call. And so you need to be aware. Sometimes we see the children in various states of healing, and we'll also see the, the wife or the victim in the situation in various states of healing because, you know, when do you go to a hospital, even with a broken arm, what's the first thing they're going to ask you? You know, what happened? And so a lot of them aren't willing to seek medical care. So it's just something to keep in mind if children have various bruises and things like that. you got to, you know, do what you got to do on that end. Rape. One in five women and one in 71 men in the United States has been raped during their lifetime. And basically kind of the next bullet point there says that more than half of them were raped by someone that they know. And so often when we're working in a DV situation, batters don't feel like they can rape their partner or their spouse. That's something that may need to be, you know, educated in the home that, you know, no means no. Things, you know, that maybe seem like the to us. They really do need to educate the family, especially the batterer, that it's not appropriate, especially after a fight, if you kind of uh, cohort her into the bedroom or things along those lines, it can qualify as the definition of rape, especially if she doesn't want to or fears that she may be hurt if she does not agree. Uh, stalking is unfortunately also very prevalent. One in seven women and one in 18 men have been stalked by an intimate partner to the point that they felt fearful or believe that someone close to them would be harmed. 60% of female victims and 43 said they were stalked by a current or former intimate partner. In the DV world, we see this very often when a woman gets ready to leave or has left. The guy will um, drive around her work, go to her house, I worked the case, uh, it was actually in Region 2, I think it was like the Duncan or Lawton area, somewhere around there, where he had called her like 80 times, but not, no, I, that's not true. Um, it was more like 30 times before 8 a.m. And so he was really trying to maintain control of her knowing where she was. It's very hard to go to job, work, you know, especially when you have children that are in daycare and you have to have your cell phone and the batterer is ringing you up 30 times before 8 a.m., texting you, doing all these types of things, trying to maintain control in your life when you have removed him. Homicide. The presence of a gun in a DV situation will increase the risk of homicide by 500%. So when you're working with these families, again, you're the first boots on the ground most of the time, even sometimes after the police have responded. I do think for your safety and the safety of the children in the home, it's always important to note if they have a firearm, which is very likely, especially in rural Oklahoma. Not as much here, you know, in the bigger cities, but rural Oklahoma, you can pretty much just bet on them having one. And so in that case, I would always just kind of develop a safety plan. Where is it at? Who has access to it? Just your basic questions for your own knowledge, as well as the victims. If she doesn't have access to the gun and he does, these are things that you may want to talk privately about her, her safety, and things like that. It's important because as soon as, and we'll talk about it a little later, when you enter the home, the batterer in particular does not want you there. He may be manipulating the situation uh, to appear that he wants help, but it is a manipulation. And so when you're in the home, the, the potential for an escalation in violence does increase just by the nature of our jobs. 72% of murder suicides involve like a husband or a wife or a boyfriend. And the victims, 94% of the victims are female. And so our, our guys in these situations are taking guns and they are, you know, killing their partners. And it does happen uh, when flashpoints, that's what we kind of call them in the DV world, happen. So sometimes he loses a job, uh, she files for a VPO, their services in the home, things like that. Those are flashpoints. It's a potential for an escalation in violence. Um, Oklahoma, the lifetime prevalence of rape, physical violence, or stalking by women in Oklahoma is greater than any other state. It's a huge problem. Uh, that stat right there basically just says that our women are staying in these situations and these families, are, our women are not leaving. They're staying with their partners that are battering them for the duration of their lifetime. And so it's important as the service providers to help them make any decisions that they're ready to make. In the DV world, we don't focus on, sometimes when we enter a home, it's the first thing we want to say is like, why would you stay? He, you know, there was a case in uh, Pottawatomie County where he had caused, 
like spinal injury and she, she decided to stay with him and so the caseworker and the service providers at that time it's not your position to question the victim it's your position to help her make the decision she's ready to make and sometimes it's really hard because the right thing for her to do is leave i mean you know we know in the gut it's we want you to leave we want you to get help but we got to provide services for while providing treatment and, and punishment or correction for the batter. That's kind of what we focus on. About one-third of all women murdered each year in Oklahoma are killed by their husbands. 30%, 33% of all police time in Oklahoma is responding to DV calls. And then I did throw this in here. Native American assault rates can be as much as 50% higher than the next victimized demographic. And so when you're working with that population, it's important to note as substance abuse is something that they struggle with as a population, domestic violence is as well. And often in that culture, it, they're, they're quieter about it, you know, the things that happen in the home. So it's just something to note when you're working with that family. Children, uh-oh, I clicked on the wrong thing. Uh-oh, I broke it. Did I break it, Nancy? No, I so. Okay. I okay. That was my bad. We're still recording. We're still recording. Okay. Uh, upwards of 10 million children are exposed to domestic violence each year. In 70% of cases in which an abused child dies, there's been a pattern of abuse against the mother. And so when I'm scrolling through Facebook in the morning and I see an infant or something along those lines has passed away, the likelihood that the, the perpetrator of the homicide was abusing the wife or the mother in that case is very high. When you enter a home with uh, men who abuse women, 60% of the time they're also abusing the children. And so if you enter a home where let's not say there's necessarily power and control, but the man and wife uh, kind of beat up on each other to uh, get their frustration out and things like that, you can expect that that pattern and that behavior is also being displayed towards the children. In Oklahoma, one-third of all domestic violence homicides are witnessed by the children. The quickest way to a parent and, to, and a wife or a mother in this case is through her children. I was reading, and you may have read it in the news as well, he had visitation, which often that happens. So even when there's substantiated domestic violence in the home, the batter often gets visitation. And he called his partner, his ex-partner at the time, killed his two children while she was listening on the phone. In return, he gets life in prison. He goes up for execution recently, and he, all the way up to getting executed, makes a comment like, I'll see you where I'm going, in, re in reference to his wife, basically. And so all the way up until the end, he was trying to maintain that power and control. I just say that because the quickest way to a woman is through her children. Batters will often use that. You may see this in your, your families that you're working with as well. Male children who witness the abuse of their mothers by their fathers are more likely to become men who batter in adulthood. It is a learned behavior 100% of the time. Oklahoma ranks sixth in the nation for women killed by men in domestic violence altercations. We've never broken top ten. We've been as high as three. Doesn't necessarily mean we got better. It means other states got worse. So what we're going to talk about now, and I'll go quickly through them, are there are different types of abusers. I think there's eight different types. When I taught batterers intervention, part of the curriculum was making the batter identify what role he, he played within the home. These roles, you can play a little in this one and a little at that one. It's not like one box fits all. I always put these in here because it's important to know when you work with a batter. We always used to say they kind of went to uh, school for batters because they thought they were really original, but they, they weren't. They all sound the same. So if you interact with them for any period of time, they, they tell you the same stories. It's, it is like they all graduated from the same school. Um, and also we would have them pick out what type of abuser they were it's because they knew that they were abusing their partner. They may tell you all day and try to manipulate the situation that they don't understand what they're doing or that they just watch their father do it, but it is a conscious and learned behavior. They are voluntarily doing it to maintain power. So the player basically is what, uh, what you would imagine a player to look like. He's usually a nice-looking man. 
and he he's kind of cocky. He's kind of got a big head. He knows he looks good. When I worked with this type of individual, when I did VIP, he would come to uh, class, even though it was like at 7 o'clock at 9 in a tank top and his tattoos out, and he just thought he was all of that in a bag of chips. They'll usually flirt and stare at women. He uses sexual undertones with most women. Uh, he is chronically uh, cheats on his partner. He will isolate his partner from family and friends because he's hitting on them. He does believe that women are here to have sex with, and if they want any of that non-sexual aspects of them appreciated, he does not. That's not okay. He won't agree to that, and he may claim to be a sex addict. Um, just reading it on a PowerPoint, it may be kind of funny, but they sure do claim to be sex addicts, and unfortunately, their victims will buy that they're sex addicts, and so we have to work within that belief and kind of, I guess, confront it, but that is something that they, they will use. Rambo, this type of abuser is pretty scary. I don't see um, one, I never saw like one guy that completely fit the Rambo, but I would see aspects of Rambo. He's very aggressive to everyone. He sees softness or compassion as being quote unquote gay. At first he's very protective of his partner. His partner usually likes this protectiveness and then it becomes overbearing. She can't go to work, she can't leave the house, things like that. Lacks respect from women. Women are weak. He sees women as a possession. And hypocritically enough, he believes that men should not hit women with the exception of his own partner. This is true. When I taught VIP, they would call out other, other men for being physically aggressive. However, he did feel justified in hurting his own partner. The victim, the victim for me was one of the hardest to interact with. Um, I do assume that in your daily job, you do see a lot of the victim. They don't understand why DHS is there. It's not their fault, X, Y, Z. And as our role as providers is to help them to take some responsibility, especially when you work with DHS, because that's part of the treatment plan is to accept responsibility on why DHS is in the home and how for it not to happen again. And so when you're working with a batter that's the victim, you may see the woman, which is the true victim, taking a lot of responsibility when she shouldn't. The victim believes that bad stuff just happens to him. He'll claim that he's abused himself. The victim will tell stories that women have um, lied or hurt him. It's justifiable for him to hurt women because of what they've done to him. He may say something along the lines, well, she pushed me and I have a right to defend myself. In that case, you know, that was an argument that was often brought up in VIP class is, well, they touched me first and I have a right to hurt, you know, defend myself. And in return, my response would be, well, and this is, this is the majority of the time this is what happens, but it's not 100% guaranteed. If you have, let's just say, a guy is, like, six foot one, and you have a girl that's 5'5", five five, you know, maybe that's pretty average, or even a guy that's 5'9", if I push a guy at 5'5", five five and he's six one, was he really fearful or did he feel threatened for his safety? The answer is no. I mean, it could be, but honestly, the answer is no. When he pushed me, I very well may have felt fearful that I was going to get hurt or felt very threatened. There's the difference in that. It does matter when we have a, you know, a little child pushing a six-foot man. There, there is a difference in that, and so they will try to play that. The next one is the terrorist. The terrorist is a scary little guy. He enjoys seeing his partner terrified. The case I worked in Pottawatomie County, he threatened to um, cut his spouse, and she actually found a knife in her home. He would kind of qualify with those. I mean, it was a big knife. He will tell his partner how much he has left to live, especially at the end he had strangled and he's on the run currently, but that he would definitely qualify. He watches her. He's following her. A terrorist would rather die than accept his partner's right to independence. And this guy will use the children to hurt his partner. Very scary. They will pass notes from the children to the mother. Even when you're in the home, they can be very manipulative in that fact. The demand man, he has little sense of give and take and he thinks that you owe him. He exaggerates and overvalues his contributions. And this guy sees being generous is used when he wants something in return or is desirable to be perceived as a good guy. So when you enter the home, a, a, a batterer that's on his A game, which isn't good, will probably be nothing but nice, 
nice to you. He will be, be nothing but nice to his family because he doesn't want you there, first of all, and he doesn't want you to know that. He wants you out of his home as quick as possible so things can continue the way that they were. And so he will be generous. So when you're in the home observing those things, it's very likely that you're going to see an idealistic version of what that house looks like. His needs are the only thing that's important, and if his partner needs conflict, he may say something like, all you care about is yourself. He gets furious when things are asked of him, and he expects his partner to be doting towards him if he drops the ball. She's expected to pick it up. An example of that would be he was supposed to pick the kids up from school. He forgets he's at home sleeping. Wife calls, school calls, the kids are still here. She's so upset. Why didn't she come pick up the kids? And his response may be something like, you knew I worked overnight. I was tired. You should have picked them up. I mean, you should have known better. And so in that instance, he will flip it around on them to make them. And then a woman that's been in an abuse situation for any length of time may say something to herself such as, uh, he did work overnight. I really should have called to see if he were asleep. I'm going to do better next time. In return, he's the one that dropped the ball. But he's very good at flipping it around on his partner. Mr. Wright, he speaks of his partner as being in danger of her own stupidity, and he will save her. Sometimes this looks like, sometimes we have batters, yes, their spouse is addicted to substances on purpose, so they can use that over their heads. Um, sometimes they will engage in relationships with women that are intellectually disabled, and he'll use that against them. He'll speak to her in a condescending tone. He sees arguments as being right or wrong. He may say something to you when you're talking about issues within the home. I have strong issues. I like debating. He does think that if you disagree with him, you're being very disrespectful to him. And if his partner doesn't come around to, to his ideas, he's going to um, mock her, make fun of her. He basically says he knows what's best. She should just ask him. They're really nice guys to work with. The water torture, I think every batterer has a little of this guy in him. When you enter a battering relationship, very rarely is the woman immediately battered. They can stay calm during arguments. They'll use low-level forms of abuse. And then when that stops working, they kind of take it up a notch. And so he may have only hit his partner once, but that's all he has to do because now she's fearful he's going to do it again. So he may come back down to the lower level of abuse. It's important to note, too, when a DV call is placed and they come into the home, a woman is frantic, she's crying, she's, get him out of my house, and he's cool, calm, and collected. Well, he wasn't the one being abused. And so who do the cops usually go and talk to in that case, they're going to talk to the one that's cool, calm, and collected. So they're getting a very skewed report of what has been happening in the home. So those police reports aren't always the best place to start, but they're they give you some information. The drill sergeant's going to take control to the extreme, controls what she wears, if she works. He'll read her mail, her emails, listens on the phone. I did have a batter one time admit in class that he had put some spyware on her cell phone um, to try to catch her cheating, and he told, he was very proud of what he did, and he reported that he had caught her cheating. In return, I asked him if he would be okay with her putting some spyware on his phone, and he got very upset at me and wouldn't talk to me for the rest of the class. And so when you turn those things around on them, they don't, they get very defensive, they get very upset. Uh, they will say things like, if I can't have you, no one will. He will monopolize her time and thoughts when he wants. And so if she's going into an FTM meeting, let's just say, he may call and harass her five minutes or even, let's say, court. That's better. He is going into court. He may call and harass her. So she's frantic when she goes before the judge. She's crying. She doesn't know what to say because she's been threatened that he's going to take her kids away. And he did that on purpose to try to maintain control of the situation. Uh, Mr. Sensitive, he presents himself as a woman, uh, as an ally for women's causes. He may cry when he talks about his feelings. These guys drive the, the Jeezys out of me. Often in VIP class, they would try to cry. Um, I would never accept crying. They needed to exit until they could collect themselves and come back because it's a manipulation tactic. Oftentimes we see men crying as, oh, they're remorseful, or oh, he feels bad. When they're working with a batter, no. He just, you hand him a box of 
tissues and you keep moving on because he's using it as a manipulation tactic. He knows that you're going to write it down. He knows that you may put, well, the uh, X, Y, Z appear remorseful as evidenced by crying during the session. He's doing it on purpose. When you work with batters, what is evidence-based at this time is confrontation. And it's never fun, but we don't, I don't put up with those things. It's not okay. I can't talk to you if you're crying. Why don't you collect yourself? And then we'll kind of get back on topic. So you can say it in a nice way, but I would not put up with any of that in your sessions or when you're working with a family. He will dominate a session. So when you come in as the embedded worker, he may sit down and want to tell you everything because nothing is more important than how he feels. That's not appropriate. Um, I'm sure you guys all know you can sit and listen to him for 10 minutes and say, well, we need to talk to some other people in the home. He doesn't care if he hurts his partner's feelings. She should suck it up. He will cast blame on his partner even when it's not her fault. She's late making dinner, let's just say, and he's yelling at her, oh, there was a car accident on the highway. It's not my fault. Well, you should have looked at the news before you got on the highway and went somewhere else. It is your fault. He will use psychobabble to impress others and make it seem like he knows what he's talking about. And so when we enter the home, we may have some counseling terms or things along those lines. He may very well try to learn uh, those topics and learn kind of what our abbreviations and things mean so he can turn it around or he can report to his caseworker that they're using cognitive behavioral therapy on me and he may use it to manipulate the situation. He's using it to sound smarter than what he is. Okay, moving right along. So when you enter a home, what we're going to talk about now, those were the types of batters. Those were just indications of what you may look for. So if you're questioning if a guy may be battering his partner or there may be domestic violence in a home, thinking back, does he meet some of those qualifications, it's very likely that he is. What we're going to look like at now is the dysfunctional family. So when you're entering a home that has a batter present in it, and I will say this too, even when you have a substance abuse user, the family takes on specific roles within the home to keep the family moving forward. So I have like a car there, and my example is when you're driving and a check engine light comes on, your car most of the time, I mean 90% of the time, isn't going to just shut down right there on the highway and you're not going to be able to move. The rest of the car is going to take um, the extra slack for a while until you get it fixed, and eventually the car will break down, but for a while there's extra slack. Uh, the rest of the engine is working harder to keep it moving. The exact same thing happens when you're working with a family with a batter in it. Our children and the family are going to take on particular roles so they can alleviate stress from the batter. Sometimes, as you know, entering a home, it's easier to do what they've always done than fix the problem because it's hard. It's hard to fix the problem. And so they're just going to keep doing what they're doing uh, to keep everything chugging forward. So when you're working with children, and this also like batters, they don't have to fit a specific role. They can kind of play different roles depending on what's needed within the home. You may have a child that's what we call the hero. They're the little parent. In the counseling world, we may call them parentified. They're the shining star. They're very responsible. They hate to be wrong. They're getting good uh, grades. They're getting awards at school. And the purpose of the hero that that child plays is because when they come and they sit down in your office or they're sitting on their couch, they, they may say something like, we're really not that bad. Look, my mix straight A's. I mean, everything is going really well. Look, if we were so bad, Maya would be kicked out of school by now. That is the whole purpose of the hero. What you don't see is that child is internally growing up. They may be very anxious to mess up. They may be depressed, things like that. But on the outside, they're a happy child. They're doing really well. The next role is the scapegoat. This person is blamed, and they're usually blamed um, when you come into the home. Well, it was Nancy's fault y'all got called. If she would have just not run away, then you would have never known. They are what you see on the outside of your black sheep um, or the scapegoat is they don't fit into their family. They're, they're quote unquote bad, they're angry, they're impulsive, they're never good enough. And the purpose of the scapegoat is because they take the pressure off the batter to look for any further dysfunction. If it weren't for Nancy, everything would be okay. They don't have to look to the batter to fix his behaviors because they found someone to take the blame. What the scapegoat is doing is they're sacrificing their own well-being in order to take that sickness off the family. They're the one that often brings the child into therapy. They're the, they're the reason 
um, that you guys are often involved and actually what they're doing is helping the batterer maintain his battery. The lost child is usually the one that's emotionally withdrawn. They're the one sitting in the hallway, maybe kind of listening to everything but playing on that iPad. They're the kid that is often a loner or he engages in fantasy play through video games or books. You may even forget that there's there. And the purpose of that child is at least we don't have to worry about him. So we have the hero in the family. Maya is doing really well. Nancy is causing all the problems. And at least we don't have to worry about Brittany. She just kind of minds her own business. Everything is fine there. That's what that purpose of that person is. The last role that children play is the mascot. And it's basically what it is. Anything for laughs. Sometimes they, the purpose of that role is to help avoid family issues by bringing com uh, comedic relief. So if you're sitting at the table and the batter is starting to get a little antsy, he's starting to point fingers, I saw you talking to a guy at the grocery store, that child may slide on in there and make a joke and it will provide distraction for the batter and make everybody laugh. So they're avoiding any family issues using humor. What you really don't see is they feel inadequate and they're scared, they're afraid of what may happen, and so they're going to step in there and try to stop what's happening using humor. Now our next roles are the batterer and the victim, the problem and the caretaker. The problem would be the batterer in our situation, and the world revolves around this person. Others in the, in the home, like the roles we've talked about, are taking on these roles to complete the balance after the problem has been introduced. So to keep the family moving, these are the roles that children play. The caretaker of the victim in our situation is going to try to keep everyone happy and the family in balance. They may present a situation without problems to the public. I went to Chili's not too long ago, and there were three children and a uh, mother and a father, I assume, and for the duration of the meal, no one spoke to the father. And I thought it was very interesting that the children were smiling, but they were all interacting with the mother. It just kind of makes me question, but it makes, you know, it's just an example of the mother trying to keep things looking appropriate when she's out in public. So some things to know when you're looking at a batter. They're more likely than non-battering men to seek custody of their children in cases of divorce or separation. And so often when you're working with a family, and most of the time when you enter the home, I'm sure the family's trying to stay intact. But if you hear a man say, they often do threaten their children with this. I'm going to take the children away from you and you're never going to see them again. That's something that battering men do to try to maintain power and control within the home. They tend to be very rigid authoritarian parents. They're very black or white. They're angry and they're underinvolved and neglectful. So when I work with caseworkers, I often tell them, uh, you know, I often get it, well, I don't know who is battering who. In that return, I would say, well, I want you to sit down and ask the parents, like specifically the father, um, you know, who are his children's best friends? You know, what do the children do? What are their children's favorite colors? What are their favorite shows? These are things that parents just know from being parents. When you get an underinvolved or neglectful parent, they won't know those basic things about their children. So it will give you a good starting place on how to work within the family. Batters do see their children as personal possessions with whom he can see as fit. And so that, that example that I gave you, unfortunately, where he did kill his two children, they're not really little people to them. They see them as mine. And when you enter the home, he sees them as you trying to take his things. It's not how we view little people, you know, of course, but it's something that he's got to work with. He expects the rewards and public status of being a father without the difficulties involved. And so even though he is yelling and cussing and hurting his family, when Father's Day rolls around, he better be taken out and he better be taken care of because he doesn't, he expects the rewards without all the hard work. And also when you're working with in these homes, men may seek emotional support from the children, especially girls. We do see higher rates of incest in uh, men who batter, something to keep in mind. Often they will pick a child that will align with them and the other one will align with the victim. Or sometimes both of the children will treat the victim and how the batterer treats the victim. So it's basically observation. If you're in the home long enough, the, the batterer can't manipulate forever. So you should see it. Why does the victim stay? So this is like the only slide that I have in particular about the victim. They, there's a study 
threatening separation or actual separation were most often led were the events that led to murder. So what this study says is they went into jails and they interviewed men who murdered their wives. And the instigating event was they threatened to leave them or they had left them and then they murdered their children or their wives or both. Often too, you will see a man, there was one case, where was I reading it at? I think I saw it on the TV. I don't remember. It was A&E or something like that. The caseworker was bringing the children over to the house for supervised visitation. He opens the door. Two children go inside. He shuts and locks the door. The caseworker calls 911. 911 doesn't respond. Uh, they respond thinking that it's more of like a kidnapping thing. He then in return lights the house on fire. And so what they do all the way to the end, they're trying to maintain that power and control. And so he is the quickest way to a mother is through her children, and he was taking that. Sometimes, too, they will kill the wife in front of the children. Victims stay for that reason. When you're working with a family, we don't want to go up to them and say, why are you here? Why can't you leave? Because in return, that, that the, sometimes the safest thing for a victim is for her to stay with the perpetrator. The one case I worked, she had been with her partner for 26 years. And so when we go to her and offer services, she's going to be the person to talk to you about what's best for her. We try not to put our own beliefs onto her. What is going to be best for her? You have been able, you've done a great job. And I know in um, wraparound, like we are very strength-based. You have done a great job keeping yourself safe and your children alive for 20 years. This must be a really difficult time for you. What can I help you with? to help you continue to be safe during this time. And if her response is, well, I need a phone so I can know where he's at at all time, that may be something that you work on. We don't want to question the victim. We want to provide her safety and work within her system. The victims often stay as well for lack or fear of losing custody of their children. Oftentimes, unfortunately, I mean, a lot of times men will get to visitation when they shouldn't. And that's just kind of how our court system is. It's changing in some places. But they often, too, sometimes when the man has all the financial load because he doesn't allow his wife to work, a form of abuse we talked about when I did batter's intervention, too, was he, you keep him barefoot and pregnant. You keep getting them pregnant and they have six kids. What's the likelihood of a woman leaving after she has six kids and now DHS is involved? She's not going to get to keep those kids. She's not. And so when we have a guy that's only access, he's the one that's got money, they will get an attorney so quick, fast, in a hurry, and she'll be left in the dust, especially, you know, if you've ever been to court with a family, it's very intimidating, and the judges talk differently to, uh, to attorneys than they do families. Also, we may have a lack of family friend support. He may have cut off all their family or friends. I knew one guy, he met her on the Internet. He's a batter, moved her down from New York. She had nobody. Where was she going to go? Where was she going to go? They do that on purpose. Also, I worked one case where the child had been physically abused, and the mother of the victim tried to convince the victim that that baby was abused in her tummy. And so that mother was even on the side of the batter, even though the batterer was the one that hurt that child. And so when you don't even have your own mother on your side, why would you leave? Where would you go? There's no support. So it's very difficult. Victims often say, uh, I did mention that, lack of means to support themselves. Sometimes the men will purposely get them fired. We do have a belief still in Oklahoma that two parent households are better than one. One case I worked, he very much hurt her, strangled her, and she knew that she shouldn't be around him, but she still felt like her daughter had a right to know her father, even though he had strangled her, the mother. And we know just from the data that the likelihood that he's going to physically abuse his child is much harder. But she has this deep held belief that she needs to know her father so that two parent households. We do have reinforcement from religious affiliations. So when we come into a home, they maybe say, well, we're going to seek Christian counseling or something along those lines. Couples counseling is never appropriate for a domestic violence situation. If they seek to do that outside of your services, that's their decision. Family counseling and couples counseling are different. What happens in couples counseling is we may have a woman say, it really hurts my feelings when you yell and call me the B word. 
and that man in that case would apologize. He would be very sympathetic, say it would never happen again. But when they leave her office or you leave their their home, that woman may very well be punished and abused for what was said during that session. And so what we do as service providers in a domestic violence situation is we can function on how the family is functioning. We can look at how the family is functioning as a whole. We can try to help them communicate better, but that's as a family setting, not as a couple setting, because we want to lessen any blowback that the victim may get when you leave the home. Um, and then women truly do believe that they rationalize that the abuse is caused by stress, alcohol, or work factors. Substance abuse does not cause domestic violence and vice versa. They will often say, well, I hit her when I was drinking. Well, that, that happened before you got drunk, and it'll happen after he gets sober. So it's never an excuse. It's a learned behavior, and they'll get drunk to blame it on them. There was one guy um, battering. He would get drunk, and he would just go crazy and break stuff in his house. And when you dug a little deeper, he only broke her stuff when he got drunk. And so it was a good indication that he, he knew exactly what he was doing because if he couldn't control himself, he would just break anything. But, no, he was breaking her things. He was breaking her pictures. He was tearing her things up. And then we do have that cycle of abuse, that inconsistency of abuse. We do have a honeymoon period. Things blow up. He leaves. He walks out. Two hours later, he comes back from the bar with roses and Oreos for the kiddos. It's an inconsistent thing. Often, too, we want to question the 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 victim, well, she pushed him. Sometimes what I tell people in our work with them is, so you have a family reunion coming up or uh, the kiddo has prom coming up and you know your daughter is so excited to go to prom, but you see that your husband is building. Like you can see it building. You know the cycle of abuse. You've been in the relationship for 10 years, and you know that he may not allow his daughter to go to prom, which she wants. In return, that victim may instigate a fight. She may push him. She may cuss at him. So he'll blow up. But by the time prom gets here, he's there in that honeymoon period, and he wants to be everyone's friend. And so when you look at it through the victim's eyes, she's providing safety and, and hope for her daughter because now her daughter is going to get to go to prom. And what they were working with, she wasn't going to get to. And so when we look at victims, we really want to work through their eyes and see things because she was trying to – I don't want to say the word provide protective capacity, but she was doing what was best for her daughter by pushing her husband so she would get to go to prom or she would get to do something like that. There was another case where he grabbed the kiddo's ears and he was um, twisting the ears to the point that, you know, bleeding, hurting the kiddo. And the mother tried to step in and have him stop. Well, he hurt the kid even more. So from then on, she never stepped in. And in her eyes, she was stopping the kid from getting hurt more because last time she did, he got hurt even more. And so there are lots of things, you know, there's two sides to every story. So here, this is something that does a caseworker a safety assessment. Same thing for embedded workers. When you enter the home, that's a flashpoint. They have the potential to escalate in violence. Some other things if you're working with a single parent home with children, if the perpetrator has recently been released from jail or prison, this is a huge flashpoint, especially if that person is in jail because of domestic violence. Here in Oklahoma, if you have three DV charges throughout their lifetime, it's considered a felony. The, before, you had to have three DV charges in 10 years. So we have that that's changed for the better. But oftentimes, we will see guys pleading down from a DV to a, a simple assault or something like that. And so that's something to know when you enter the home, how many assaults and things like that, because it could be domestic violence related. However, the one case where he's got a warrant for a felony strangulation, uh, when they pick him up, I mean, who's the first person he's going to blame when he goes to jail? It's her. So when he gets out of jail, who's the first person he may go for? Her. The victim initiates any type of services. Uh, the perpetrator has become recently unemployed. That's a big thing. Filing a PO or a PO is served to the batter is a huge flashpoint. That's a very scary time in her life, and that doesn't necessarily mean that that batter is going to follow the PO. There are things that we do uh, for victim safety. There's court-appointed advocates. If she is fearful of being in the room with him, which does happen, they can have a court-appointed advocate stand in her place. Our DV shelters can outfile POs, but I would always put that back on the family and I put that on her because she's going to know that what's going to keep her safe. And if knowing where her batter is at all times is what's going to keep her safe, then we need to work within that system. 
The batter is referred to child support services. They don't often pay their child support or they'll be very upset about it or they'll try to get her to pay child support. The divorce or custody proceedings, if the batterer feels like he may lose his partner or the batterer has had charges filed against him. These are all times when you're working within the family that could escalate to violence. So that's when it's important to have maybe safety plans in place, know who we're gonna call. When you're working with a family, if you want to get a good understanding of how that family is functioning, these are some things that I recommend you do if possible. Sometimes it's never, it's not possible for them to come into the office. It's just not. And if they're on the back 40 or, you know, down on the dirt road, you have to work with what you have. But in a perfect world, we want to interview the adult victim. So even if she's going to stay with her batterer, we're going to interview her by herself. Somewhere, like if you were in the office, I would leave him in the lobby and take her back so she knows he can't listen. If you're out at the house, if it's good weather, maybe you could walk up and down the street and yak at her for a while uh, because then you're going to really get a good picture of how the family is functioning. If at all possible, talking to the family members separately, including the children, and then including the mother as well. You take the kiddos out, you walk up and down the street with them, and I would even walk and um, if there's several children doing that with each child, because sometimes children will align with the batter and run back and tell them, or the batter may use a child against another child, things like that. But I understand this is this is a perfect world. Um, things There's a lot of red tape and logistics when you enter a home, so these may not be possible, but something to keep in mind. When DHS has entered a home, that batter may have threatened to call DHS for years. And so when DHS enters the home and they're like, oh, no, we got a, a complaint from one of your neighbors or a doctor called for medical neglect, that victim may not believe that. And so when you enter the home, you really may not be getting the whole story because that batter has been telling her for five years that it's her fault, they're going to call DHS, and then you enter the home trying to help. She may not want to accept that help by being fully and complete honest with you. So if you're in a home, these are some examples. These are interviewing examples to determine if domestic violence is in the home. Asking your adult victim how her fi uh, family finance is handled. Often the man will control the finances. When I worked with batterers, they would sometimes even give their spouses allowances, and that allowance was um, expected for them to buy groceries and everything the children needed as well, and, and it was measly to say the least. But that's going to give you a good idea because who controls the money usually controls the home. If you could change anything about your relationship, what would it be that's to the adult victim? And then how do your children treat you? The children will often treat the victim the way the batterer does, unless they're aligning with the victim, which is possible. But often children will blame the adult victim for not leaving the home. And it's understandable if we look through a child's standpoint why the victim hasn't left the home, but you will often see some animosity and things even towards the victim. And then the adult victim, how does your partner participate in parenting? Like I said, they're very often uninvolved. Little things like you may not notice. One case, she always, during uh, her time at home with the kiddos, every time a husband was getting ready to get home, she had to turn the TV to the weather channel. Because if it was on, let's just say, married with children or something along those lines, he would question what she was watching. He would never argue with her if it was on the weather channel. And so it's little things like that, questioning the children, what did your mother do all day, things along those lines. The child, some questions you may ask is, what do you like about your dad? What do you like to do with your dad? And what are some things that bother you about your dad? That might give you a good indication. And when you work with the batter, um, how do you earn your children's respect? How do you discipline your children? They're very, um, I guess, spare the rod, spoil the child kind of approach. Do you and your partner have conflicts, and how do you handle those conflicts? These are all going to give you a good indication of how the family is functioning and how, as the embedded worker, you can help this family function better. Okay, we're not even going to go over this one. This is what DHS does um, for visitation. This is what best practice, uh, supervised at a visitation center, supervised in the community, and then two hours um, of supervision, day long and overnight. This probably isn't going to be very applicable to you in the home unless you're working with a single mother, but hopefully this is what DHS is doing. This is what's best practice for batters, but that doesn't always happen. So when children have visitation with a battering parent, 
the batter's lack of availability can increase its value in the children's eyes. So if you're working with children that just got back from a visitation, don't be manipulated to think that just because that child had a great time that they weren't battered or battering wasn't going on in the home. Up until the point that DHS or Systems of Care was involved in their home, they had no relationship with their father. And so now that you're in their home, they're safe. They know they're safe because daddy won't do anything in front of anybody else. And so they're going to enjoy their father. So things to keep in mind, often we'll see the father undermining or overruling the mother's parenting decisions. They'll burden the children with too many worries. Um, if your mom would just take me back, I could eat, I'm so hungry, I have to pay all this money towards an attorney, it's your mom's fault, they will come back and manipulate the mother. So if you're trying to do some crisis intervention and the children are yelling at their mothers, you, doing some exploration may help. You often see Disneyland dad, and even if the family's intact, you may see this. You may see dad pulling kids out of school on a Friday, taking them to the city for Frontier City, because what he wants when they go to court is for those children to say, I love my dad, I want to keep seeing them. Of course they want to see their dad. He doesn't do anything with them, but pay, you know, 30 bucks to get him in front of a city. A good example or a good, I guess, practice if you're entering a home like that is to have the father like, um, we're going to come over and do visitation. Or I'm going to come over, we're going to do a family night. What would you like? That shouldn't be a movie, maybe a game night, things like that, to have a good indication of how the family's functioning. They will use children against women. The badder behavior towards the mother is a predictor of how he treats the children you will often see a favorite child. And children who identify with the batter are likely to abuse younger siblings. Unfortunately, I worked a case where they had to do sibling separation because every time he was around his sister, he would um, physically attack her. And we couldn't, they couldn't get through that in the time to establish a permanency, so they did separate them. He got a single parent home on a farm, was doing fabulous. She was doing really good. They still got to see each other. But due to the extent of the battering, they weren't, they couldn't be in the same home together any longer. Okay, so treatment. What we recommend for treatment of victims of domestic violence is they go to a certified program. The certified program is going to have a victim advocate and children's services that does not negate systems of care, anything that you're doing within the home. This is separate to it. Often our shelters, children can live there. The one in the city now even has a kennel so they can take their animals as well. So if you have questions, if they're trying to file a PO, if they're trying to do any of those things, it would probably be best practice for you to sit down with your victim and contact the hotline with her and help her figure out what her services could be and what her options are. The danger assessment, if you're working with a family in which the woman has a high possibility of being hurt by her partner, there is what is called the Jackie Campbell lethality assessment. It's 20, 25 questions paired with a cal uh, calendar. And uh, you, take, you can take it at a shelter. You have to be certified to administer. But it's going to give that victim a lethality number. I believe it's one to five. The higher the number, the likely the more likely they are to be a victim of homicide. This may give some insight into the victim. It may not. It's just a tool in our toolbox I wanted you to know about. For BIP, we have certified programs. They have to be certified by the Attorney General's office. Online is not appropriate, and you may hear a lot that they do have to pay for that. That's an uh, Attorney General's rule. That's not anything else. DHS shouldn't be paying for BIP classes. It's their kind of rule just for your FYI, they may have taken the DVI, the Domestic Violence Inventory. It has six scales on it. What we look at a lot is that violence and control. So if you're working with a family, usually they don't re-enter the picture until a couple months later. But this DVI gives us a good indication of the power and control he has in the house and wants in the house. You could probably look at it uh, even within your role with their permission, of course. But it, it does. Uh, help you understand how his coping is, things like that. It gives you a scale from zero to 100. So some tips. we um, Mental health services are not a substitute for DV services. So just because you're in the home, that does not mean they, can't, they need to go to DV services. Uh, we're not going to do any couples counseling. I wouldn't recommend it at all. Um, like I said, they're adults. If they choose to do that as, on their own, that's up to them. When you're working with these families, avoid neutral phrases like the violence between your parents. 
that's going to obscure the batter's responsibility for that. What we want to say is the, the violence that your father has done or something along those lines because we don't want to ever blame the victim. Uh, we can observe parental skills of our uh, uh, post-separation. So that's where we're asking those questions. We can also observe how the children respond after visitation. Substance abuse does not cause DV. And this right here is kind of like when you go to FPMs or a child is placed in kinship care, please keep in mind that if a child is placed in kinship care on the paternal side, who would be the, the batter, that they may uh, manipulate the situation to look like the children are responding worse than they are after a visitation with their mother or something along those lines because battering is a learned behavior and they learned it probably from their parents. Keep in mind at FTMs that we always want to let the victim know what we're going to talk about. I had a question once. He was referred, Maya, for BIP. What do I do? My first thing is call the victim. Let the victim know. Ask her. Uh, let her know when you plan on calling him. Ask her if that's okay. Always keeping her abreast of the situation, even as the embedded worker is going to help keep her safe. When you're working with a batter, these are the things that we look for to see if the batter has changed. Very, very hard to us. They may be like, duh, but the, the recidivism rate for battering is very high. So it is not likely that he will get better. They can get better. 100% I believe they can. It is very hard for a batterer to change his ways. Uh, these are some things we're going to look for. They have to recognize that they chose that behavior and that it's unacceptable. They can tell you what type of manipulation tactics they use. They have to develop respectful behaviors, attitudes, make amends long and short. They have to disclose the full history of the psycho psychological and physical abuse. And they have to accept change as a long-term process and be willing to hold accountable for that behavior. Mm. Woohoo! I finished right on time. Okay, uh, that is my last slide. If you have any questions, there's all my goodies right there. I work with Nancy very closely. She's amazing. I do DV cases all the time. So if you have any questions or concerns, holler at me. I've made some friends at the Attorney General's office as well. I had one case where he had three DV charges and he was teaching DV class. And so we have some options there. So just holler if you have any questions. I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Maya, very much. Um, okay. So I've got 10, 957. There's a couple of things I want to make sure everybody knows before we end the call. On the 15th, we're going to have an embedded care coordination wrap, wraparound training 401 in McAllister. You should have gotten... And you know about that. If you didn't, please contact me as soon as possible so you can get that information. Um, again, I want to say thank you to Maya. And uh, if you would, please send me an email that you were on the call. Thank you, and have a great day.